society or the social rules or what you can and cannot do in, among people. And then how strange it is that you can do some things among some people and, some, and you can do them among other people. Now, for example, if you take a really bad example of this, there's no actual rule that a lecturer can't undress during a lecture. But my boss doesn't like it. Now, I've asked him for the rule, but he can't show it to me. So there's some sort of social organization here. No nakedness during lectures. I'm sorry, okay, I got that, I got that. It's all, I'll keep my clothes on, we're all happy. The layer of the contextual social and social rules are, is the architecture. Now, the architecture you, are, is what you guys do all the time, so I don't really have to explain it to you. Now, what I find interesting as a lawyer, not as a programmer, is the way in which now that you know, the architecture that used to limit us in an analog world, when we move to a digital world, there are less analog things in the way. So what have we done? What, do, what does law do? Well, law does a really wonderful thing. And if you, if you want an example of this, you should just look at, at um, copyright, for example, or file sharing. Since it's easier to file share in a digital environment, we need to have more sort of blocks. And what we do is we create artificial barriers by using the law. And it gets really, really silly. And it's really, really funny. And all the lawyers are really, really serious. You guys should actually, one day, just for the hell of it, go to a serious law conference with serious lawyers who discuss file sharing. It is, I mean, you stand there, but, but, well, file. No, you don't. Okay, right, yeah. You feel really strange. You go, but you have children. They file sharing. And you go, you're lying. But if you it's such a thing back in the social part, you can't say to people, you're lying. They can lie to your face, but you can't tell them you're lying. It's very, so it's very, very, so that's, that's the sort of way it's going around. That's the, that's the law part. Anyway. There's a short version of this, of course, is that technology allows us to do stuff. So society usually encourages us to do stuff, and the state profits from this stuff. Now, I'll try, try to explain that in, the, in, the, in the, the rest of the lecture. So first of all, the technology part. Uh, and this is the part which I usually have to explain in really, really excruciating detail to other people, but I'll just go quickly through it here. There's sort of four things that have sort of majorly changed our lives. And for most users, they don't even understand that digitalization was important, or that connectivity was important it's there, it's always been there. Haven't we always been digital? Yeah, right. And the fact that storage devices are going down, the cost of storage is like, yeah, going down. And you, you guys are going, what's he talking, why is he talking about this? But if you tell this to ordinary people, sorry, outside this room, that's important to tell them, because they don't get that. And the last part, of course, is all the little devices we have. And those things are changing our behavior. But all this is really not really that fascinating, unless you interpret the context which I want to talk about, and that's, of course, social media. And it looks like this. And, and, and um, for most people, again, you've seen this before, you know what it's all about, this is what happens. But the results of these kind of technologies, <clears throat> and of course, please, be nice to me, I, I call this technology, I know, you're a bit, sorry, yeah, that's not true. These kind of, of toys, then, let's put that, is that for a lot of people, the, what is what were theoretical rights beforehand have now become practical. And they've also become almost inevitable. So we take a case in point. If we go talk about uh, freedom of expression, Sweden has had a law for, for, uh, that regulates freedom of expression since 1700. And, um, yeah. yeah, there you go, late 1700 something. Um, but of course, it's not very difficult to give people. You can all do what you like, but you can't really do what you like because you have to get your opinions into the printed press or into the newspaper. And there's a very limited people, a group of people who can do this. And that limited group of people are controllable by other means. So when all of a sudden we, <laughs> we get the web, well, that didn't really, it didn't affect that many people because most people weren't online. But when we started getting the easy stuff, when Blogger came along, the first thing we did was, oh, there were lots of people going and there were lots of serious blogs. And then all the fashion bloggers came and everything just you know, changed. And then Twitter came and nobody's blogging anymore and we don't know what to do. But the interesting thing, of course, is that we see now, we have to talk about what would, when we, well, and, and this is the part I love about lawyers, you see, because if you give them a word, you know, everyone has the right to freedom of expression. But not on the internet, no, no. Because then we, can, then we can do the lawyer game. The lawyer game is really fun. So you can ask questions like, what is a document? What is a paper? What is a signature? And indeed, if you have the right to freedom of expression, what is the expression? And in Sweden, we are bound by the European Convention of Human Rights, which states we have freedom of expression. But in Swedish, we have yet. 
That's a freedom, freedom of speech. Okay, that, that's, yeah, we are. No. So you take a cake and you throw the cake in the face of the king. Is that an expression? Or is it a speech? It's always not a speech. That's not a speech act. Well, Chomsky would say, yes, but lawyers, no, 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 no speech. <laughs> you know what else? It's wonderful. It's a lawyer game. We do this all the time. Then, of course, we have the fact that when our technology is changing, the, law of, the social rules are also going slow. And we had the, oh, and uh, thank you for explaining what law was like the same thing. I just saw this from Wikipedia. Law is a system of rules, a guideline, blah, blah, blah. Very boring. Now, I've been looking at this stuff for way, way, way too long, so I get a bit strange. And um, I was really, really pissed off because it took me six years to write my thesis. But that wasn't, that wasn't what pissed me off. But <laughs> What pissed me off was I, one day I just clicked on XKCD and he did one, one cartoon that explained my whole thesis. <laughs> it's like, fuck you too. Yeah. Here it is. This, I mean, it's it. I was trying to explain the connection between how, how technology rules our lives. And this is the US nuclear chain of command according to XKCD, of course. And you have you know, the president, the secretary of defense, and, you know, uh, and then the engineer who installed the red button. And he, yes, that's it. It's like, oh shit. And I would love just to have given that to my thesis committee. like, there. <laughs> Make me doctor. <laughs> just to see their faces. But you're not. You know, at that stage, you're not doctor yet. So you're like, here? It's very, very difficult. Um, and of course, this situation is very, very interesting. And, I, I keep, I, and this keeps coming back to me because I like this, this document a lot. Is, can you imagine if there was no feedback on the red button? I mean, I have, I have one of these washing machines in my home, uh, no, sorry, the, the dishwasher in my home, where I turn it on and I have to go, and I can't hear it. It's really annoying, so I stand there going like this, and there's no feedback. <laughs> now imagine, you know, this new, we've all seen the movies, it's a nuclear war, it's a red button, it's got the little you know, the see-through cup and the key, you know, they're all the see-through cup, they're all the same design. I wonder the, you know, where you can buy those, Class all sort maybe, I don't know. So you go there, and you open it up, and all the generals standing there like that, and he goes, and imagine if it didn't go. I mean, how embarrassing it would be to be a lot starting the third world war going. Does this, does this work? The engineer, he has a lot of power here, obviously. Now, there's lots of other things that we have to think about with, with technology. There's also the fact about the affor uh, what affordances you have, and, I, and, and uh, I love affordances. I love trying to talk to, about affordances to non-techies because they go, it's just technology. It's neutral. And I keep showing them this. This is the park bench in Tokyo. <coughs> Can you spot the ethical idea of dilemma? Yeah. No? You can't sleep on it. You can't sleep on it. Well done. Mm. This is part of the ways in which you control society without having to involve well, all, the, uh, all the whole democracy bullshit thing. Because if you were to put a sign up there that said, no homeless people, there'll be some annoying group of people going, oh, that's sad. <laughs> but what you do is you buy this bench and you can't sleep on it. You go, well, oh, it's just a bench. <laughs> I love that. It's like, whoa, it's just a bench. And this is the part that scares me when, when, sorry, when you guys start talking about making the law and the last lecture, all the questions, I go, my God, my head's going to explode. <laughs> and I love the part where it's like, no, 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 uh, because we all do it and we want right privileges. It's like, Shit, Mario wants right privilege of the law? <laughs> and he wants to give him to this person he met in a Thai restaurant? <laughs> yeah, I want that. <laughs> I mean, I probably like it. I like Smurray, so I'll probably like the steak, but uh, yeah. No. I've seen Smurray. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, moving right along. Uh, the, the next part I want to talk about is, is the social media and the connection to regulation by proxy. That's just another necessary slide, so I have another one here. Now, regulation by proxy is about the way in which the state is really having a lot of fun right now. They keep going, oh, it's not our fault. I love that part, that you can actually have this sort of, this, I mean, we vote for these people. They're supposed to be there for a purpose. They're supposed to be doing lots of stuff that we don't like and a lot of stuff that we like. But for some reason, they're supposed to be helping us. But because we are also using a lot of technology that's built by and, 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 and kept for us by other people, and we keep signing our names on things and clicking on things. The state can go, well, hey, it's not our problem. And then we have things that what, happen, what the, re the result of regulation by proxy is things like this. It's the warrantless search. I love the idea of a warrantless search. I mean, this is, this is only a lawyer can dream up this situation. I mean, because 
If you want to look at my garbage in the United States, it's not really the same as me. You have to have, you have to go to a, to a, to a, a lawyer, has to go to another lawyer, and they have to go to the, the, the district attorney, and they have to go to a judge, and they have to get a, a piece of paper, and this paper is important, but you preferably have to read the piece of paper to someone to look at garbage. But to actually just to access someone's email account or someone's Twitter account or any kind of account, uh, hi, we'd like to look at your account, or we'd like to look at someone else's account. Yeah, what was the name again? <laughs> just type in. It's fantastic. It's brilliant. And only lawyers can say, well, this, you see, this is not really a search. Because it's all there anyway. <laughs> and I go, well, wait, wait, um, uh, yeah. But, but this is how they work. I mean, this, and this is regulation by proxy. Because what we're doing, the state is saying, well, it's not our fault. It just helps us a lot. But it's not our fault. We end up being in a situation that we're relying on people. And, and, and relying on people is very strange. And, and, and what we have to then realize is that I am dependent on lots of people who I've never met with lots of crazy ideas. And I've met Smurray, and his ideas are the craziest. But I mean, OK, I've met him at least. So it's not like, I know, it's not the kindness of strangers. <laughs> Stop talking about Smurray. Um, <laughs> so I have to start thinking about what do the people I'm dependent on think. And basically, I'm trying to get inside the mind of people like Zuckerberg. And it's not a happy place. <laughs> We're talking about a guy who says things like, privacy is no longer a social norm. And he's not saying it for me. He's saying for you, for us, for everyone. And I, he bases this on a wide-ranging decades of empirical re bullshit. <laughs> he's just basing it on the fact that people use Facebook, people share stuff on Facebook, and he can change the rules, and people will still share stuff on Facebook. Okay. So he changed the rules. Now, okay, I, I'm not too concerned about the fact that he doesn't really give a shit about my privacy in this situation. I'm more concerned about what happens if he starts going to the next step, and he's already gone to the next step, of course. It's not really what they can look at. It's what they will let us think about. And they have to look at his mind again. And I say, yeah, it's not, this is a dark corner of, of you know, the internet. <laughs> a squirrel dying in your front yard may be more relevant to your interest right now than people dying in Africa. Mark Zuckerberg. Seriously, only a mother can love this person. <laughs> and I'm not sure about that either. Oh, sorry. I, I won't bring Zuckerberg's mother in this. That's, that's unfair. That's, that's below the belt. Sorry. What we're talking about here, of course, is the dream of personalization. It's a dream of actually helping people find out and get information about what they want to know. But before they know, they want to know it. That's the, idea. That's the whole dream. And the reason why they want to find out information before we know that we want to know <clears> the information is to provide to us in advance. So they want to tell me, before I'm even asked the question, this is the answer. And you think, oh yeah, well, okay, well I can just get off Facebook, can't I? And of course, then you go, well, no. Uh, Eric Schmidt from Google said, it'll be very hard for people to watch or to consume something that has not, in some sense, been tailored for them. And in one way, yes. Most people go, oh, great. More relevant spam. I mean, seriously, that's a, that's a good thing. I mean, some, some spam is, is somehow relevant, somehow. But at least I'll get rid of the really irrelevant spam. Maybe, hopefully. That's, that's the sort of the idea they, they keep telling. But it's not about that, because personalization is actually about trivialized, trivialization. Well, that's a difficult word to make. What do I mean by this? I mean information junk food. <coughs> now, information junk food is an idea that goes like this. Basically, if people find out what I like, and they want to keep me happy, They'll keep giving me what I like, and I'll be happy. End of story. No. Well, yes, actually. But, <laughs> but the problem is that I will keep getting the same shit fed to me. But it will be shit, because I like it, so it will be, be good stuff. If you think about this in evolutionary terms, we have come, from a, a biologically, from a place where there was a lack of food. So a lot of our time is, what are we going to eat, and where can we find it? Seriously, this is probably what we ask people a lot, most of the time. What, what are we going to eat, and where can I find it? <laughs> In Sweden, it's what are we going to drink, and where can I find it? But that's a different question. Um, now, of course, if Google, Facebook, and all the other companies up there find out that, wow, Matthias really, really likes, let's take a uh, bad subject yesterday, kicking kittens. 
He's a malicious little bastard and he likes kicking kittens. <laughs> what are they going to do? They're going to feed me kick, kitten kitten. Oh, I shouldn't have done that one. Kitten kicking videos. They're going to feed me kitten kicking links. Oh, gosh, I should have chosen that. <laughs> I will end up becoming information obese. Same way as if I keep look, you know, eating my hamburgers and my pizzas and my red wine. Oh, I love my red wine. I also will die earlier. So in the same way with information, if I keep getting the shit I like, I will die because I will get too much of it. But more importantly, I will stop doing what I should be doing and thinking and eating my oatmeal, which is really boring, isn't it? So, that's one of the fears about trivialization, about personalization, is that we close the lids of, of information and we focus on the bad stuff, which is the good stuff in one case. And eventually, of course, it flips over. It's not really me wanting, it's them creating me wanting. And this might be one thing with McDonald's and advertising, but it's one thing with the information about Google giving me the information I want. That's scary. I would like that this would go really, really wrong. And I have one, one historic example I could think of where it went really, really wrong. And it's, of course, associated with food. It was Marie Antoinette. She said, let them eat cake. That didn't go so well for her. <laughs> I don't think we're going to have that. I wish we would have some sort of some anti-revolution thing, but I think what we have to be prepared for is a lot of dead squirrels. <laughs> this is what we're going to have. And in the meantime, I want to look at three points here for the rest of my talk, and that's uh, the, the idea of surveillance, connivalence, which is really awful, but I just learned it today, and altervalence. So these are all ideas of different types of surveillance that are going on. And I want to give a little private, a context of privacy, and the first thing I want to talk about is something called, another word I learned recently, Proxemics. Hands up, proxemics. Well done, yes. Thank you for playing. Two, yeah, well done. <laughs> Educated crowd. Uh, proxemics is basically about how close you can stand to be to other people. In other words, if you are Swedish, you would like to be over here. And if you're Latin American, you're just sitting in his lap and going, hi. <laughs> that's, that's the short version. It's probably obviously more complicated than that. Now, the idea here, of course, is how much surveillance and how much closeness we can stand. So there's some sort of idea, therefore, that uh, as cultural individuals, we have different values. I don't want everyone to touch me, but some people can touch me. Very, very strange. I've had to actually have researchers doing research on this. It's a fascinating book, by the way. Now, since there's a, bi there's a biological part to this, there's a sort of one way of looking at it, saying, well, maybe somewhere there is a limit to what people should be doing with me and to me and looking at me. Strangely enough, we didn't think about this seriously until the 1890s, when two American lawyers wrote a really, really boring article, no, actually a very good article, called The Right to Privacy. And their idea was, oh, there should be a right to privacy. And, and the wonderful thing is, what they were discussing was that civilization is moving faster, there's more information, and technology is making our lives so intense. This is 1890, by the way. <laughs> that we need somehow to withdraw from this. We need a space of our own. We need a private lives. And um, the article was like very well uh, received, but it was also very, very, you know, it was poo pooed all over the place. No, no, no. We, no, no. Sorry. Bye. Nice try. So it actually took almost 60 years until the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, where we actually had someone saying, yes, privacy is important. Cool. So we go from 1890, it was like, nah. To 1948, where it's like, yes. 50 years onwards, and we have, nah, not really. And that's okay, because that's like you have no privacy. That's like you should have it, but you don't have it, so just get over it. But the next step, and then we're back to Mark again, because Mark is my favorite guy right now. <laughs> Having two identities for yourself is an example of a lack of integrity. <laughs> this is not like you don't have it, get over it. It's like you shouldn't have it. You're actually even wanting it is bad. And of course, he's saying this from the point of view as a social engineer, not as a programmer making money off this. Of course he's making money. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so first of all, surveillance. What is that? That's basically the idea that power comes from, a, it's a power structure where someone's looking down upon you, and it could be the state, it could be, we've talked about other, other players like big companies as well. Um, usually it's, it's the idea of the Big Brother Society, the state as the superpower helping us. And it's actually not really a superpower because they're actually not interested in 
helping us more about slightly controlling the way in which we behave. It's all based on a really fascinating set of theories uh, that, that stretch back to, to uh, Jeremy Bentham. And Jeremy Bentham, he was this cool philosopher type of guy. He said, oh, we want the best, uh, the, uh, the, the greatest amount of, of goods for the greatest amount of greatest amount of people. And in his free time, <laughs> he wrote, uh, had a correspondence. He was in Russia somewhere, and he, had, he wrote letters to his friend. He said, I have this really cool idea. I want to build a prison. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't think he told everyone about this. So it's just with his friend. So obviously, yeah, yeah, happiness to everyone and a prison for me. Because what he wanted was to build this prison. He wanted to be the, 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 the warden of this prison. He wanted that to be his day job. Which is like, but you are, aren't you this sort of this wonderful, fluffy kind of philosopher guy, you know, happiness to everyone or good to everyone? But yes, his idea of the prison was to build a round prison where all the individual cells were facing inwards. The inmates could only see a central pillar, but they couldn't see inside the central pillar because they'd be louvers flats like that, and there would be an incredible amount of punishment involved here. Actually, it was not, uh, if you look at the, at the way the society was then, the amount of punishment was much, much less, but today we go, oh my god, That's, we're talking about the amount of punishment that only exists in American prisons, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> at least in American prison movies. Um, the idea, of course, was that, uh, and this was developed then by Michel Foucault, was that each prisoner, if he didn't know when he was being watched, would never dare to break the rules at any time because potentially he could be watched at any time. What would happen is some sort of, you would internalize your own surveillance. You would become your own prison guard. And this, of course, was a fantastic idea, fantastic theory. And people went, not when, not when Bentham wrote it. Bentham wrote about it, they went, yeah, OK. But when Michel Foucault wrote about it, it was like, wow, this is really cool. And we've been talking about Michel Foucault and, and the Panopticon prison since then. The only slight niggling problem with this, of course, is that now that we have a total con uh, 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 surveillance society, we have people tweeting, we have cameras, we have fingerprints, we have everything, you know, and people seem to, well, they don't give a shit. The actual idea that you are being watched doesn't seem to prevent you from doing really, really bizarre stuff. <laughs> and I'm not talking with alcohol, I'm talking without alcohol, but you know, with alcohol it just gets worse. So I'm kind of confused about that, but okay, well, let's just move right along. The next step on this is, is, is the idea of surveillance, the gaze from below. And this was really cool for a while, but I looked at it for a long time, and it's just, it comes out at a dead end. Yes, we try to survey the people who are, we're watching the watchers and that whole thing, and it's like really interesting. But I just went, oh no, I can't do that, it's boring. So that doesn't work. So what are we doing? Well, then I, I sort of hit upon it. It's not really looking upwards, it's looking sideways. It's people looking at their friends. And now, the, fr word for, the, the French word for friend? Anyone? Or uh, acquaintance, okay. sorry. Friend is what I mean. Acquaintance? Connaissance. Well done, yes. And it's also, interesting enough, the word for knowledge. In other words, somehow, it's a, it's a connection between I have knowledge about someone else, which I find totally fascinating, because it works really well today. Because what's happening here is a question of social ties. It's a question of me having connections with other people. What, the, what these connections are, it gets a bit vague. Now the interesting one, and of course the word friend is really double talk, let's not go there. What happens is things like this. Now this happened, uh, this was up, came out yesterday, 12th of November. Uh, I'll translate for those who don't know it. Uh, this is from Cyborg Christina, who apparently has left the building. Um, thing that can happen at FS Cons, Clang 67, declares himself to be queen. A little unclear of what? <laughs> I've been outed! Now, the interesting thing is not the fact that I can say this at this conference. The interesting thing is that this thing just has a life of its own. And it sort of wanders away, and it's like, woo, come back. And of course, I'm screwed. I have declared myself to be queen. My mother's going to be calling on Tuesday. Are you all right, dear? I mean, how do I, you know, it's people with connections to people. And we go back, of course, to the whole idea of the small world theory there, where, you know, you're a sixth step. Have you heard this one? The, you know, the, the uh, Kevin Bacon thing? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I won't do that. Um, but there's another step of, of this, of course. That's one part that's boring. But the next step is even sort of even stranger. It's the whole outer valence. It's sort of me surveying myself. It's a gaze from within. I am my own information gatherer. Well, actually, I, that was always there, but I'm now my information spreader. So I will tell people what I had for breakfast. I will take photographs of my coffee, which, by the way, I do. I'm embarrassing enough. I take photographs of my morning coffee and I put them online. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> and one day I didn't. 
And someone sent me an email, where's the coffee? <laughs> I was like, okay. Now, and then all of a sudden I have a social requirement to show people my coffee. It's like, show me the coffee. It's like, what? <laughs> So yes, this is, this is somehow, the, oh, that's, that was a very bad picture. It says, out of valence, the gaze from within. Must choose better pictures. Uh, out of valence is some sort of exhibitionism, maybe. But what we do know, it's about myself. It's some sort of narcissistic idea that I am good enough to show everyone everything. And of course, if you meet people who don't like Twitter, especially if you meet older people who don't like Twitter, I had a nice conversation with a man who in Brawls three days ago, he said, oh, Twitter is all about telling people what you had for breakfast. What's the point of that? And I tried to explain to him that, yes, it is about telling people about what you have for breakfast, and that's the whole point. <laughs> I didn't win that one. <laughs> now, the thing is, if you look at this from a non-technology perspective, we see that we've always sort of leaked information. As soon as I walk into the room, you can say, oh, he has a T-shirt on, he has a Creative Commons sign on, that means something. He wears these kind of clothes, he waves his arms, and that, that means something. But what we used to be able to do at least we believe we used to be able to do, or we practice different strategies. And these strategies, I haven't found a good word for them, so I call them compartmentalization. Basically, the information I tell my students, hello students, and the information I tell my mother, my wife, my mother, my children, my dog, are different. They might not be totally untrue, but they are, occasionally. So, for example, when I tell someone I like wearing women's underwear, it doesn't have to be that my students need to know I like wearing women's underwear. Because that might, maybe, eventually change the way they think about me. <laughs> oh, sorry, I just got thought, would that be better or worse? Um, <laughs> never know, is this it? And, of course, my boss would then come back to the naked thing again, wouldn't he? <laughs> and we don't want that. I mean, he was so embarrassed the first time, you know. <laughs> So what we have, of course, is that when we have a world with algorithms trying to figure out what we like and trying to figure out who we are in different locations, taking away the barriers between the compartments, making us into one identity, we are screwed. Now, why aren't we doing something about this? Well, basically, of course, because we have analog social norms. We're still stuck in the idea that, oh, what I tell my wife will stay with my wife, what I tell my, my wife's sister will stay with her wife, or my lover will stay with her, and so on. But now, all of a sudden, they all put it on Facebook and someone outs me as a queen, and I'm screwed. I mean, I'm supposed to be at a serious conference this weekend, and I'm a queen. <laughs> what kind of conference was I all that at, really? So the social norms are different. The legal norms are, are different, because then we have an idea that we have a protection from an outer gaze, but now the gaze is from me going out. And then, of course, my friends are helping me. Thank you, friends. And, of course, then we have Zuckerberg going, yes, two identities, bad. So, the result. Where are we going? Is this the end of privacy? Are we really just that screwed? Cheers. <laughs> if you got to go. Well, there have been some experiments with this. And I've, I'm, I've been looking at some really serious philosophical experiments with hive mind things. And they aren't odd. But there are. You can find you know, the, 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 the werewolves in Twilight. You can find the Zerg and the Borg and whatever. And, and the agents. Please explain the agents to me. I'll never get that, yeah, but anyway, you know what I mean. They, they, they have one sort of collective mind, different bodies, one mind. But one thing you do learn at law school, well, two things I'll tell you what you learn at law school. But, uh, one of my, my, my professors said, you can never go into court and waive the Constitution. It's just no point. If you go into a Swedish court and say, the Swedish Constitution says, they'll just laugh you out the building. The second thing you can't do is you can't go into court and say, well, you see, in the Matrix, <laughs> they, that won't work either. So I was sort of, okay, well, this is basically, you know, I can't do much with this. But then, then, thank you, a Swedish professor of philosophy, a wise man, a great man, a thinker, he wrote the book Private Lives. And in Private Lives, he said, the main problem in life is not that there is privacy or not privacy. It's that there's an information equality. I'm oh, sorry, information inequality. That's a big difference there. And the fact is that I may know things about you, but you don't know enough about me. Or well, his, what he was really worried, worried about was that the state knows stuff about me, but I don't know enough about the state. So he was basically putting forward, let's have a Swedish hive mind. What a boring place that would be. Um, the idea, of course, was, was interesting, but the thing is, 
once you get a professor of philosophy saying things like that, then all of a sudden the little lawyers go, oh, that's a good idea. And they can, you can't go with the matrix, but you can go, oh, well, we have a professor here. Hi, it's mine. And it, you, you're stuck. I mean, it's interesting. And I said, well, I was quite, I admire this guy, so I was quite worried about this. And I was, you know, it's, it, but then I realized, this is basically some reformulation of the whole, if you have done nothing wrong, you have nothing to fear. And the basic flaw with nothing to fear arguments are, is, sorry, can I say, <laughs> that they are, have an understanding of, of privacy and secrets as being harmful or dangerous. Now, not all secrets are harmful or dangerous. They can just be secrets. And for those of you who haven't read enough secrets or just don't procrastinate enough, the site Post Secret, I recommend it. New secrets every week, fantastic. And you can get things like this one here. Uh, I love my iPod because I can listen to Christmas music all year round, and no one can judge me for it. <laughs> now, that would probably embarrass my students more than the ladies' underwear. I mean, if I want to keep my cool status there, the ladies' underwear is okay, that would be bad. <laughs> so this is what's happening. The idea is that all our little secrets, not the big secrets, all our little secrets are being spread. And you think, well, come on, people should be getting pissed off. And of course, where is the righteous indignation? Where are all the, where are all the masses out in the street saying, we want our privacy back? And I realized, well, you know, they're not there. They're all on Facebook. <laughs> and this is, of course, because they're losing, we're losing, our privacy, our right to privacy, our concepts of privacy, thanks to uh, Zuckerberg and friends, by something called the salami method. Now, to explain the salami method, I hope the video works, it just works very strangely sometimes, I want to invoke another great philosopher. Let's see if this works. Oh, it's not going to work, are you? Oh, shit. Does it go work like that? Good to see you. Now, uh, a late drink might be wiser. Better not to let the cabinet office know. Sir Humphrey gets very upset. He doesn't regard the chief scientific advisor as one of us. I thought he won the day so, Arnold. That doesn't make up for speaking with an Austrian accent. <laughs> but he certainly didn't go to Oxford or Cambridge. He didn't even go to the LSE. <laughs> Prime Minister, you do believe in the nuclear deterrent? Oh, yes. Why? A big one? Why? <laughs> because it deterred. <laughs> Whom? A big one? Whom? Whom does it deter? Well, the Russians from attacking us. Why? A big one? Why? <laughs> because they know that if they were to launch an attack, I'd press the button. You would? Well, wouldn't I? Well, would you? <laughs> last resort, yes. Yes, I certainly would. Well, I think I certainly would. Yes. <laughs> and what is the last resort? If the Russians were to invade Western Europe. But you only have 12 hours to decide, so the last resort is also the first response. Is that what you are saying? Mine? <laughs> you don't need to worry. Why should the Russians annex the whole of Europe? <laughs> they can't even control Afghanistan. Now, if they try anything, it will be salami tactics. Salami tactics? Slice by slice. <laughs> One small piece at a time. So will you press the button if they invade West Berlin? It all depends. On what? Well, scenario one. Riots in West Berlin. Buildings in flames. East German fire brigade crosses the border to help. Would you press the button? The East German police come with them. The button. Then some troops. More troops just for riot control, they say. And then the East German troops are replaced by Russian troops. Button. <laughs> Russian troops don't go. They are invited to stay to support civilian administration. The civilian administration closes roads and Tempelhof Airport. Now you press the button. I need time to think about this. You have 12 hours. Have I? <laughs> I'm inventing this. You are Prime Minister today. The phone might ring now from NATO headquarters. <laughs> Hello, yes. NATO headquarters. <laughs> so this is basically, we are the prime minister in this situation. We are the ones going, of course I'm interested in privacy, of course. And they go, will you give me your passport if I give you a cheap pen? They go, oh yes. And this is not, uh, that's not a joke. And they actually did an experiment in, in a London train station. I'm not exactly sure if they got the right passport, but they gave out a lot of pens. 
Uh, we have rules in, in, at this university, for example, that we must have really, really complex passwords, we must change them every three weeks, and we must not write them down anywhere, and you just go and ask people, and so you, you go into people's offices, and on the notice board, there are lots of little passwords. On posters. <laughs> yeah. So, so we, we really care, but we don't care at the same time. Now, the thing is, when it was <coughs> us against the state, if we're going to have against the state, we had some sort of theoretical control. Now, I don't want to get too cynical, it's Sunday, it's late, but basically, you know, we, we at least somehow believe in the illusion of democracy that we can vote and things will happen. And, of course, we all know that if that doesn't happen, we can have a revolution. Of course we do, but just not now. It's Sunday. Um, so the next step, of course, is, is that what do we do against technology companies? Well, the only thing we can remember and keep telling people is that technology is not inherently democratic. It doesn't have this sort of guiding principle towards some sort of better life. It can be used for all means. And we have to keep looking at the people behind the technology. And that's basically it. Thank you very much. That guy looks like Sucker. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> nice pictures, Nate. You actually have one thing. Yes. Um, hi, by the way. Hi. He's not a student anymore. No. I'm here anyway. Uh, <laughs> you have one problem with one of the pictures. He I said sorry, but it was a picture of a Protoss. <laughs> I what? You had a picture of a Protoss, but you said sorry. Yeah. Oh, so. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. I, I'm getting out of date. I mean, as you noticed by my, my movie skills here as well, it's a, they're kind of old too. Yeah, I thought I'm curious. So, what exactly are you queen of? Oh, no. You'll have to talk to Christina for that. <laughs> Actually, the Christina, that's true. They move in pairs. <laughs> hive mind. Oh, oh, they, oh, yeah. Actually, for me, women do seem to have this some hive mind thing, but that's a totally different problem. That's a gender thing, and we should be talking somewhere else there about that. So, yeah. 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 Yes, thank you. Uh, what did you say you were working on now? <laughs> Procrastination. No, um... <laughs> I, yeah, of course. No, I, I have two major projects in my life, and they're both equally boring. One is, is uh, copyright licenses, like Creative Commons and things like that. And, uh, oh, we, we party hard. I mean, we can discuss, you know, well, actually, copyright licensing. <laughs> and there's the other part of, my, of what I'm doing is basically looking at social media and online identities and how we're changing the way in which we understand ourselves and understand other people. Uh, but I'm also doing other stuff with social media because, well, it pays well. <laughs> No, I, I find it very interesting because it's, it's changing the social norms. So those are two areas where I'm looking at right now. Yes? I actually have a serious question as well. Oh, the queen uh, thing again? Uh, <laughs> no, um, regarding the idea that um, one more uh, right to free expression is controlled by, by corporations, mm. um, we saw this very nicely with the WikiLeaks, right? I mean, yep. you had the, the provider basically uh, throwing them out. You had the, online payment uh, companies uh, cutting them off uh, and so on and so forth. And of course these companies are not responsible to anyone except for their owners. Um, and yeah, they can just say, you know what, well, if you want something I don't like, I'll give you a, uh, suspend your account. Um, how do you deal with that? Do you have any thoughts on what, like how, how can they be held? Uh, well, um, the, the way in which it works today is that we put certain values above other values and one of the values we put above everything else is the idea that individuals are supposed to be autonomous. Now, now this is a myth that we really like, so you have the right to do almost anything, but then uh, we say, oh you can't ride a motorbike without a motorbike helmet or you can't drive a car without a seatbelt. That's basically saying you have to limit your rights. Um, but when it comes to stuff we're doing online, and especially stuff that doesn't seem to interest the government, it doesn't cost them anything, in fact, it, it makes it cheaper for them, they don't do anything. So what we do need is we need politicians that are prepared to say ugly things like, you should have less rights. Because what we're saying then is like, you are too stupid for Facebook. You need help. But then, of course, that means that you have to find a politician that, first of all, is going to say something ugly about Facebook, there's not many of those around. And the second thing, you have to find a politician that's seemingly prepared to go against the idea that everyone has the, has the capacity and the intelligence to talk about anything. Um, I think what, we'll, what we need, since that can't be done, what we really need is to have the states, uh, the, the, the organizations of the state, the schools, libraries, archives, explain to people exactly how dangerous this is. Instead of saying, like, what mostly happens with, with schools and libraries and universities, oh, you should be on Facebook. 
everyone should be on Facebook. I've been, I've been to, to uh, academic pedagogic conferences where they say, oh, Facebook's a fantastic school for, uh, tool for learning. Well, why not my own university? Was that? Student mail is really, really not working. Now, this is not surprising. We're a university. We're not really good at designing things like student mail. But we designed student mail at a point where everyone already had email because it was better for us. And when the student mail stopped working, we said, uh, it really did stop working several times. There was a little meeting, and the little meeting was, should we transfer all the students, and there's like 38,000 students here, to Microsoft or to Gmail? <laughs> that, was, that was, I mean, and, and, and this was a technical decision. And they decided on Gmail because the user interface was nicer. This is the, the, the and, and I, I got annoyed again. And I wrote a, 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 an article, a small article, a sort of an annoying point where I explained different things that this cannot be done, this shouldn't be done, this is morally, legally, so, socially, everything wrong. And I got a response from the people that the IT, uh, the head of the IT at uh, Gothenburg University said all the right people were in the room when the decision was made. But the interesting thing, of course, was all the right people were discussing the wrong thing. You had a lawyer in the room discussing user interface. That really helped. So I, I think one of the things we have to keep telling people is it's not about how pretty it is and how shiny it is. And that. It's, it's about what it does, what it takes away. And we have to keep telling that to people, explaining that to people. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> it's depressing, yes. But there was a very good point you made that had nothing to do with the question I asked. Oh, you'd rather repeat the question. I just took it from somewhere else. No, no, no. I mean, I don't disagree with what you said, but my question was more about um, so if, say, um, our infrastructure provider uh, now mediate, basically, our ability to have free speech, um, how can we still maintain having the right to free expression if it's corporations in between me and my ability to express myself and those corporations are not you know, required to give me yes. this right? Well, where you have to have politicians who are brave enough to say that that the corporations are wrong. The problem is that the corporations have more power with the politicians than we do. So basically we need, our, we need to enforce our rights. And we can't do this, in the, well you can try, but we'll get thrown out one, one by one. You can have maybe some sort of massive protest. Those usually don't work. Uh, but the idea is yes, you need someone. Yeah. Well, I was gonna say, in theory anyway, that, that could be something that a market-based solution could provide, I mean, because if, if Everybody is fearful of Corporation X, you know, doing what we're talking about here. It provides an opportunity, a niche for somebody else to start an organization that makes a pledge that, for whatever reason, people are willing to believe that they will honor to not do that. And so you will get a migration of users to people who care about that. In theory. in theory, yes, but the problem, of course, is network effect. And what you have is, like, is that, yes, we should all leave these and, and go to some other one provider that will give us a better solution, but we know we won't. Or we might, but not enough people will. There's the idea of momentum. Yeah. But uh, it's, it's one person at a time, these kinds of changes and activism, so, you know. Uh, yes, I, yes, I just wake up different days and they feel different ways, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, and what, we, what we've, the idea was, of course, that you have to have, have to help uh, the, the, the friendlier ISPs, for example, to come into the market. But what we've seen, those ISPs that actually try to be friendly are almost penalized for being friendly. So in, in Sweden, we have legislation that all data is going to be stored. When one ISP stood up and said, well, we won't store data, they are slowly, slowly going to be penalized. They continue doing that. So, so there's, but you need brave politicians, and, and that's not really two words that tend to match very well. I don't know. <laughs> A brave decision. Yes. yes. Yeah, so you're you're talking about how uh, you know technology, uh, uh, well, some technology anyway, can is neither good nor bad. Uh, and obviously, we as programmers have uh, increasingly, you know, more and more power uh, as we have you know tools like uh, uh, OpenSSL and uh, you know access to strong encryption. We can definitely, I think, uh, change the 
uh, scale and potentially uh, disrupt the system, like uh, Smari uh, <laughs> talked about. Um, and obviously, uh, uh, in, uh, me and my colleague, we're, we're very interested in Bitcoin, for example. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what do you think about the future? And, and uh, yeah, what do you think about Bitcoin? Well, I mean, I think Bitcoin is a fantastic idea. I, I had lots of questions there, but I realized I was too stupid to ask most of them. Uh, because I needed to be an economist and a programmer uh, instead of being a lawyer. Um, my, I'm cynical today. I mean, I've been here for two days. I, I need a shower uh, and stuff. Um, <laughs> it helps, or it doesn't. Um, I think that if Bitcoin actually does become big enough to be a legitimate player, it will be considered a threat and it will be sort of neutralized. WikiLeaks for other problems as well, but if WikiLeaks had been allowed to exist and grow big and grow strong, bigger and stronger, it would have been a, comp a real competitor to established media and therefore it would have been taken out of the way. Now, you had a question first and then we'll come back to you, uh, and I'm sorry, then you, then you, then you, Ian. <laughs> uh, yes? yes. Uh, today I got a short message that I should uh, send my personal identity number to my uh, mobile phone carrier. Uh, and uh, it said uh, pro uh, that they need the personal identity number so I can uh, buy tickets and uh, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. First, I uh, got upset and on the second spot I thought, uh, why am I so upset? I pay like many people uh, do in Sweden with credit cards, so someone already uh, is, has my, my da data, where I am, what I bought, and uh, the credit card company already has my personal identity number, like many, <laughs> many, Times, yeah. many institutes in Sweden have. So uh, aren't we already in the mess? We are in the mess, but that doesn't mean that we should keep helping them make it even messier, is my point. Uh, and, and the fact is you're probably not helping them to help you, you're just helping them. And that's the part that really annoys me. Uh, if you take the example of Swedish trains and having to identify yourself, it's not really about me uh, providing some sort of security, it's about them having a bad business model for selling tickets. But that's a long story. But yeah, I, I don't think we're actually helping. They, they, they're selling a story that's false. But the thing is, of course, once, once someone goes and starts selling a story, you have to prove them wrong before you can change that story. Yeah. Uh, one question. Uh, okay. Uh, are they right? Someone uh, uh, read with me the, the uh, paragraph there in the law, and uh, we thought uh, um, Comlik isn't right there. Um, okay, so I mean, I, I would love to say no, but I don't know enough about German law to say if they're they, right or wrong. No, 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 I live here. Too. You live here, welcome here. Okay, uh, sorry. Um, no, I would, I would, it's a question of are they asking it as a compulsory request? No, compulsory request, isn't that wonderful? Uh, can you say no? Uh, what can you do? So, so I, I would have to look, and I've of course, even if the law says no, they would, we would have to challenge that. And that would have to be challenged first by the data uh, inspection authority, and then in the courts. And that's a long battle. I think there might be processes going on around. Pardon? I think there might be processes going on along that because people have complaints about Okay, cool. That's nice. I, it's nice when people complain that something happens. I like that. Sure. Okay. Yes? Well, I want to add to this about the uh, personal number. Well, what many people in Sweden seem to forget is that the pop personal number for 99% of the population, or 99.99 even, is public. Yeah. Uh, along with a lot of other details like uh, uh, where you live, uh, if you got charged for something in court, etc., etc. And many people don't seem to know this. Uh, and, and they don't seem to react on, on that. If I lived in Netherlands before, and uh, yeah, oh yeah, Let, let's go and get and, uh, and ask the tax office of my personal number of my friend's personal number. And they say, "Fuck off." But, but, <laughs> but this, I mean, this is what I mean. This is sort of the Slavic yeah. method in practice. I mean, we we given so many parts of ourselves away that we don't really mind if someone else takes another part or takes this part and uses it for something else. Um, there's a really interesting discussion going on in India 
because they want to actually start using personal ID numbers in India. And, and there's apparently a huge, I mean for Sweden, it's like, you're actually bothering to discuss this? Come on. I mean, for us, we're so programmed with it. You are first a number, then you are a name. So, but, but yes, I think, I think the important thing is not to say, well, you know, we've already given it away once, so let's give it away again. It's not a one-time thing. It, it's, I mean, you can remain a version in different situations. Does that make sense? Sorry, I'm getting tired. Yes, did you have a question? No? no, you had a question. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, you said that uh, the social norms are changing and, well, privacy becomes less and less important as, uh, as most people don't care about it. I actually don't really think that they don't care. <coughs> most people do care, but the problem is that uh, very popular and convenient services like Facebook, Google, and so on and so forth have real name policies. And that's something that you have to balance. Yeah. And in the end of the day, you choose, okay, I'm going to be on Facebook. I'm not going to be left out. You said the magic word, convenience. And that, that yes. tends to win the most situation. And there's also the thing is that you might care, but when you, when, when you have received several, several requests to, to join this, <coughs> this thing, you just click on it, and then you say, oh, would you like to read the privacy uh, 16 pages of, of bullshit in, in lawyer speak? And the wonderful thing, if, you, if you've ever clicked them up, they're really nice, because they begin, we care about your privacy. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, this is double talks. I mean, you, uh, it's, yeah, I, I mean, we are doing things that are convenient, we shouldn't be doing. Yes, there you go. So, uh, uh, in response to your... Uh, I'll be back, yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, just a comment on giving up uh, your personal ID number for train tickets or for registering your phone to get train tickets and so on. For you, it might not be a problem. You have an ID number. Yes. You're a Swedish citizen. Yes. If you're a tourist, or even worse, if you're a paperless immigrant, yeah. mm -hmm. um, yes. you might be in a situation where you want to see your lawyer. Um, or, or actually go to a doctor. Yes. Yeah. And I actually, I, I was discussing this on Twitter the other day, and one of my Twitter friends, a lawyer who is also an immigrant, she said that she has had, she's got uh, clients that can't come anymore because basically they don't have any paper, they are in the process of applying for things, and they can't move anymore. Yeah. And that's, that's I mean, we have to protect those people who don't have ID numbers. And, and yes. might, might even be here illegal because we've actually said that we are, we are going to give health care to everyone. And people without ID numbers are here as paperless people don't get health care. And that's actually a violation. So yes, and then yes. Right. So uh, in response to your uh, uh, talk about uh, neutralization, uh, in this talk you, you explain how uh, the uh, digital, uh, the analog uh, reality and the law uh, maps very poorly onto the <laughs> digital reality. And uh, my personal observation uh, in technologies uh, pertaining to cryptography and so, so, stuff like that is that, um, uh, well, take BitTorrent, for instance. You have uh, uh, people um, uh, complaining about it, and in response, you build the technology even more resilient. So you can actually, with uh, the increasing uh, availability of, of uh, tools we have and different technologies, you actually tailor the technology so that it doesn't uh, break the law. Uh, and when you're building something you think that can break the law, or that's going to break the law, you make it uh, more and more decentralized and resilient, so it's actually so, impossible to... to um, we, we, have, question. we gotta wrap up. We have to wrap. I, I mean, I agree with you, but file sharing of, of copyrighted material is peanuts compared to what you're doing. You are actually attacking the monetary system, the fundamental state, the right to control country. Sorry, I mean, if we got pissed off about some people copying films, what are we going to do when you start making money? <laughs> <laughs> you are the real hero. So. Yes, well, thank you, Larry. Thank you very much.